Hey guys, and thanks for tuning in to the first Glitch Kitchen episode of 2019. I'm Sam, aka 5AM, and the year is starting off pretty hectic, so I figured I'd make this video a shorter one with less technical rabbit holes and more quick tips. It's going to be a little scatterbrained, but there will be many useful nuggets, so stick with me. So the topic for today is template set upkeep. So Ableton gives you the option to save a custom template set. And it's a really good idea to create a template that has a lot of routings and instruments that you commonly find yourself using. This will save you so much time and allow you to dive right into the creative flow as soon as you load up Ableton. What I'm going to do is give an overview of my template set and talk about some of the theory behind the template and key features that I built into my workflow, including auto-loading my favorite instruments, side-chaining groups, gain staging, and more. So this is pretty important. If I want to save something into my template set, I'll go to Live. Preferences, File Folder, Save. And then that's going to overwrite your previous template set and replace it with whatever you currently have open. So first I want to talk about why I put so much time and attention into the template set. Um, the way I like to think of this has to do with a concept that I would call priming. So throughout my template set, you'll see a lot of pre-made racks and samplers with lots of content loaded in. The idea is that I don't want to be searching through all my sample packs for a diamond in the rough. I want to have already done that work, and instead I'll just be picking from my favorite sounds. That keeps me more entertained as I work because I like what I'm hearing, and it keeps me more productive because it's faster to, to get to where I want to be. So uh, what I won't show in this video is all of the hours that I've spent populating the template with sounds that I like and deleting the sounds that I don't like. That would be pretty boring for you guys to watch. But some people talk about separating sound design and production sessions. And that's a really important concept here. What I do is I almost do like workflow or organization sessions with all of my sounds. And uh, it's really helpful for me in terms of like helping to define my sound and helping to get me from A to B. And this is particularly important right when you're about to dive into your next release or right when you're about to start a new creative project. Say you have a five-track EP that you want to make. I'd say, I'd say before you even start working on a track, you should be putting a solid amount of time into building a sound world. For me, what that is is my palette of sounds that inspire me, like mellow, jazzy keys, or heavy bass, or a certain type of like crispy snare, or some inspirational audio like from an old movie or something you recorded with a field recorder. So I'd say go into your scattered sample packs and delete sounds that you don't like. Delete sounds that don't inspire you and keep sounds that do. This is also a great way to break through creative blocks because it gives your analytical mind something to do that is lower pressure than starting a track. But sometimes you hear that one sound that gives you an idea and that becomes a beat and that becomes beautiful music. So you can almost trick yourself into starting a track by doing this more mundane organizational work. So this brings me to my places sidebar, and I've gone into this in other videos, but um, I've recently made some upgrades. So of course I start with bass, which is just a folder full of some of my favorite bass samples. Then after that, I have some drum loops and things that I made with a friend who plays a mean drum set. These are just things that I can layer over my projects at a moment's notice. If I, want, if I want some new inspiration, I can just go into one of these folders, whether it be sample packs which a bunch of, with a bunch of different melodics and drum samples and things like that, uh, recent, recent recording sessions or audio capturing sessions that I've done with friends. This was a, a friend's virus synth uh, that we recorded, and so I can just pull out just weird chops of a virus synth. So if there's some, if there's a sound or a type, a type of sound that I want to use more, I try to put it towards the top of my places sidebar, whether that be things that I tend to use a lot or things that I wish I used more. And the same is true of my instrument tracks, which I'll be getting into. If I want to use something more, I'll put it in my template set so I'm more likely to come across it. I'm more likely to see it. I also have a folder full of sounds that I've created. Um, so if I just want to, if something feels bland or I want to introduce more crazy sound effects or more sound design into it, I can go into my alien sounds folder. So 
So uh, now I'm going to go through my set here, and I'm just going to talk about each group individually and try to quickly touch on some of the more important parts of uh, the template. So on this bass track, what you'll notice is that I have a deactivated automations group here. I'll try to talk about this uh, shortly. But more importantly, I have a sidechain set up. So I have two compressors, one a sidechain to the kick, one a sidechain to the snare. I'm not going to go too far into the sidechain setup right now, but uh, all of my groups are have some sort of sidechain apparatus on the uh, on the on the group. So the first thing in my bass group is just a basic sine wave and operator. So that's pretty helpful uh, to just start a track and just get a really nice kind of full beefy sine wave that's got some nice harmonics in it. Now I've got a bass sampler. So if I have like uh, a neuro bass sample that I want to use, I can just uh, drop it in there and then go to town. And this position knob changes where in the bass it's sampling from. And I also have a reverse thing, which just turns that reverse on. So I'm just trying to introduce as much novelty as possible, as quickly as possible. I'll talk about the FM in another tutorial, but there's some interesting stuff you can do with FM inside of Sampler. And I've got an audio track in case I want to drag in some uh, bass samples or just random effects in there. The synth group also has uh, two compressors on it and a EQ high passing at 80 hertz, which is really helpful for frequency separation so we don't get any bleed in the low end so that the bass and the kick are the only things occupying the low end. You'll notice that also on uh, my atmosphere group. Snare group has a high pass. And uh, sometimes I'll put it on my percussion group. Probably should be on there, but uh, yeah. So my synth group has uh, an instrument rack. This is a pretty crazy instrument rack. This is a rack which is switching between two chains of just, that are just full of instrument samples. And they're the same sampler, but you can change using these sample selectors. You can switch between one of 128 different melodic sounds that are all tuned to the same note. So you can play melodies while changing the timbre. So I'll demonstrate that. Again, the idea is to introduce as much novelty as possible uh, with as little work as possible. So I'm just turning these knobs, but the sound is changing dramatically. And that, what that does is it keeps me inspired as I work. I can just uh, make a MIDI clip, drop it on here, and then just play with different timbres. I also have a sine wave, just a little like, right now I think it's more plucky. But uh, you can turn that into like an atmospheric pad if you want. So it's pretty useful for filling out the spectrum. And then I have a simple Rhodes keyboard. And I have a crazy uh, sound effects generator where I took all of my like 5 a.m. Uh, sound effects that I've made and I just dropped them into one sampler using like a 128 technique, which I won't get into right now, but it's pretty neat. But I'll just demonstrate what this is. So there's a lot of potential there for further glitching out all these already pretty glitched out sounds. It's probably really good for... Uh, risers and things like that like you just make instant risers out of you know all these sounds so that's fun and then uh the atmospheric group is just to drag in like bits of audio and stuff and put a big reverb on it and just uh create some background atmosphere and then uh I have a kick group. So this is pretty important here. I'll talk about the transient grabber. What this is doing is I have a deactivated transient chain, which has a compressor on it, which is acting as a transient shaper. It's, it's, it's grabbing just the click of the kick. So I have a little loop over here. I'm going to play the whole thing later, but I'll just solo the kick for now so you can hear what's going on. 
So if I solo this transient chain, it's deactivated. So the audio is not coming out. Um, the audio is not audible, but this little click. So here it is without the compressor. And then with the compressor, the compressor is just grabbing the initial attack, the initial transient. And it's okay that it's clipping because you're not actually going to be hearing that. But what that is, that little click is going to be sent to the bass track. And that's going to be what the bass is sidechained to. So I went in and I selected the transient grabber. I said transient grabber post effects, which means that it's taking into account the compressor that's, uh, that's isolating the initial attack. And that's just going to make it a smoother kind of release or bounce back. Because if you had the whole kick there, it would push the bass down too much. It would sidechain the bass too much. But with just that initial click, the bass bounces back more responsively. And I'll, I'll play this loop in a minute, but uh, that same effect is happening on all the instrumental tracks, and it's coming from both the kick and the snare. So the snare has the same transient grabber rack on it. So this bypass is where the, the actual audio from the, from the drum comes out, and then that transient grabber is just going to take the initial attack and send it as a sidechain signal. So uh, I have two kick 128s. I have a digital kick 128. And I have a lo-fi kick 128. And yeah, so that's just 128 samples loaded into a sampler where the knob here, the sample selector knob, is cycling between all these different samples. Same thing with the snare, except in the snare group, because snares are such an important part of the music I make, I just have all kinds of different snare layers and samplers, audio track, things like that, to just add as many layers as possible. But I'll, I'll just walk through this really quick. So uh, I have 128s for acoustic kind of hip-hop style snares. And this is two 128s that are layered, so you can get more nuanced varieties. And I've got some high passing going on here. Sometimes I'll add a little vocoder noise. Sometimes I'll, as you can see, there's a kind of a more dramatic EQ here. I actually just, I just adjusted that. So normally it would be more like, it would start out more like that. Just, uh, just so you know, multiband compressor. So that's brightening, brightening up the snare a bit. And that's just one layer. And then, uh, yeah, this snare layer, that, that more digital snare. And then I have a cluster layer, which is really fun. So the cluster is set up in more of, in a drum rack. And uh, what that means is that you can play a bunch of different notes and it'll, it'll layer the sounds in time and in uh, timbre. So, and the, this cluster's track is actually just a drum rack. So it'll, you can kind of layer a bunch of different sounds just by hitting a bunch of MIDI notes. It's a little extreme in the high end there, but that's another thing that I just adjusted for this beat. But so just hours of fun, hours of entertainment for uh, fun snare layers. I have another snare layer 128 that's not in use right now, but yeah, I really went in on my snare sound design, and uh, over time, that's gonna you know, as more time is put into mixing and placement of the notes. Um, that can create some really nice uh, layered snares. But I don't really want to get too in depth right now, so I'm just gonna just gonna duplicate something that I liked. Oh yeah, that's the beat that I uh, that I'm using to kind of demo this whole setup, but. Yeah, so the percussion works in a very similar way. Um, the hi-hats here are all on a drum rack, and I just have 128 <laughs> different, I think that's 128 uh, slots in the drum rack. But anyways, I just have all kinds of hi-hats in here from all kinds of different places. Like I have uh, 
hi hats from full crate from vibe squad sample packs from vengeance from what else we got here my own recorded hats that's all these little these guys some of them yeti even <laughs> uh yeah i just picked up a bunch of different hats kind of along the way from like different free sample packs and stuff i got from friends and yeah and I did the same thing with splashes and crashes, so I just have a bunch of my favorite cymbal samples here. And you can layer multiples to get different creative combinations. And then, uh, same thing with rides. This is fun. And uh, I think they're all... Well, they're not even going into the same reverb. So if you put the same reverb on here, they would really sound glued together almost like they're all being played on a drum set but they're all from different drum sets that i picked up um and then i have like yeah live hats and digital hats i think that's yeah hip-hop hats but the, these are more digital hats and then i have like some live drum set hats which are fun to play with oh there's an arpeggiator on this one that's fun yeah arpeggiators are a great way to get variation really quickly anyway so now I'll just quickly touch on gain staging. So I have um, all of these groups, except for that one, which is taken in my audio input. What's up, me? Uh, yeah. So I have all these groups here are turned down a bit so that when they're all summed together on the master, they don't clip or they don't cause clipping. Um, so inside the group, I don't really care about where these, where these individual track levels hit, but uh, some people do. Some people will keep their tracks at like negative 6 dB. I don't really care like where the tracks hit before they get to the group, but uh, I probably should. I probably should keep individual tracks a little quieter, but it's just how I work. And, you know, you're free to experiment in terms of how your gain staging works. But yeah, so the bass now is at negative 8 the synths and vocals are at negative 8.5. That fluctuates a little bit depending on the tune. The most important thing is that the drums are at negative 7. And that makes them the loudest uh, things in the mix. And I, I think that this is a good representation of where things should be sitting generally. So the kick and the snare would be the loudest, followed by the bass. And then the synths and vocals and things kind of sit right behind that. And... Uh, on the master, I currently just have a glue compressor adding a little bit of gain. I could probably, you know, turn that up more, but not gonna. And then for actual mastering, um, I would just use like FabFilter Pro L to like just quickly bounce out a tune to play it live. And that's just got like some limiting on it, but I'm not gonna really go into that too much right now. But uh, yeah, so I produce sometimes with a limiter on the master and sometimes at uh, pre-master levels. It really just depends and I kind of go back and forth as I work to hear if I'm hearing any mud or uh, to just hear if anything jumps out at me, depending on um, which, uh, whether, whether my limiter is on or off. But uh, yeah, and so the template set is also a great place to just put things that you might want to use, to just put useful things that you'd always want to have at your fingertips. One example is this handy Max for Live device called Session Notes. So yeah, I can just type up um, interesting ideas if I wanted to. Uh, and then it'll save. When I save my set, I'll be able to look back at my notes and see what I might want to change or see what I might want to do. Uh, I'll often set little arrangement markers here, say something like A section, you know, stuff like that. And then on the base, I have this automations group which if I click that, uh, the chain volume, you'll notice this is off. So it's not actually doing anything to the audio. But on this chain volume thing, I have, uh, let's see if I can show automation. I just have a bunch of automations here that uh, you can like copy. You can paste them onto a parameter that you might want to automate. And that will just save you a lot of time in Carpal Tunnel. If you just want some random automation or some movement, it's nice to have that built into your template set. So if there's an effect that you really like on your bass, put it in your template set. If there's a plugin that you don't use that you keep hearing about that you'd love to master, put it in your template set. 
for me, it's Razor. So actually, yeah, I'm just going to create a MIDI track, bring out Razor, which I have saved into a group so that I don't have to actually load up Razor every time. It'll just, uh, if I save it into an Ableton group as an ADG, it just loads up immediately. So that's cool. So, personally, I feel like I want to use Razor and Serum more. Those are two VST synths that I really want to start incorporating into my workflow more. So I might pull out one of them and uh, just save it into my template set. And now, when I load my setup, it's always going to be there, so I'm more likely to use it. And I think that's really important. So it's just about kind of stacking the deck in your favor before you even start, so that you'll you'll give yourself the best possible chance of making a creative breakthrough or of making those improvements that you want to make. And I'd really encourage you guys to get to work upgrading your own workflow. Who knows? You might accidentally start your next tune. Just remember, when you like what you've created, just go Live, Preferences, File Folder, and Save. So I hope that was a good overview of how I think about my template set. Thanks for watching, and keep it glitchy.